We've talked now about the brain, the spinal cord, the eye, and now we're going to talk about epidermis and hair. Of course, we're on the outside of the body where the ectoderm would be following the ejaculation. Sort of makes sense. So, uh, this just uh, sets the stage here of the embryo following neurulation. It's going to be covered entirely with a layer of ectoderm on the outside. And last time we were talking about ectoderm that was up here um, at the top of the embryo, and that was already predispositioned to form the neuroectoderm, which gives rise to, of course, the brain and the spinal cord. But all the rest of this ectoderm around the remaining part of the body, that needs to form skin, hair, uh, sweat glands, any of these structures uh, associated with the really external layers of the body is ectoderm derived. So looking first at the skin or the epidermis in humans, this has uh, several distinct layers to it. Um, four of them mentioned here on this slide. And the very uh, innermost layer, we see a layer of cells called the basal stem cells. And these would be an example of an adult stem cell. So on the one hand, these cells are, um, they have the property of being able to divide over and over again. So not all, not all cells can do that. Many cells will kind of reach a point in their life where they don't divide very much or just only a few times. But these basal layers uh, continually divide and they form the source of the <coughs> cells for the epidermis. And I think you all realize that we're constantly in the process of shedding our skin cells and so we need a new, a really good stem cell to keep the whole process going. So uh, these are down here. You can recognize them in sections because they're sort of cuboidal shaped. Uh, okay. So after they start dividing, they're going to move gradually outward into more exterior layers in the, in the epidermis. And the next layer is called the spinous layer. And uh, this is so called because of the shape of the cells start to become more irregular and have these little protrusions or spines to them. About this time, uh, these cells also start making a protein uh, keratin. And so as they move yet further outward, those little black dots are indicating uh, masses of keratin which tend to coalesce within the cell and form these clumps. And this becomes sort of like the obsession of these petals. They just start to make more and more and more keratin until finally the point where the cell and the nuclei um, well, the nuclei die, and then these cells just become these flat bags of keratin, basically. So up there on the fourth layer, those are the cornified uh, layer. <coughs> and that's where these cells are flattened and basically full of keratin. And so this gives these cells a particular property of being, you know, really um, kind of strong and uh, protective for the organism. They just um, uh, form sort of a shield on the outside of the body, which is what we'd like to see. Then also there are some other cells to point out here. The melanocytes, these are the cells that make pigment. So um, for different shades of humans, they're making uh, different amounts of melanin from the melanocytes. So the pigment melanin is made within these cells. And the melanocytes are actually not um, originally born within the basal layer. They're a neural crest cell. So this is our first mention in the course of a neural crest cell that came from a different part of the embryo and had to migrate and then integrate into this basal layer where they then become um, established and undergo proliferation and produce the melanin that gets the skin gets pigmentation. Yes? Oh, which layer did you say that they would start making keratin? I'm sorry, it's so loud out there, I couldn't hear you. I was wondering which layer you said that keratin starts being made in. Oh, the keratin is already starting to be <coughs> progressing the spinous layer. Okay. Yeah. If you guys need me to repeat anything because of that noise, just let me know because it's going to be kind of challenging. 
Okay, so keratinocyte stem cells. Um, these cells within the basal layer can also be called keratinocytes, so as another name. Uh, melanocytes making pigment. And um, these two together, the basal layer and the spinous layer, these are collectively called the malthigian layers, and they are the ones that are actively dividing. So those cells are actively going through mitosis, and then by the time we get to layer three, they've sort of ceased that active mitosis part and are just busy making more keratin. Okay, so here's a, a section through an actual uh, piece of skin or epidermis to show you what these layers look like. And you can really make out the basal layer here because of their nice cuboidal shape. Uh, spinous layer, uh, more irregular, but the nuclei are still prominent. And then the granular layer, you can see all those dark pigmentations just of keratin and uh, then finally how flattened the cortified layers are. So there's probably at least 10 to 15 layers of cells in the cortified layer that are shielding the outside of the body. Yeah. As the cells in the basal layer start dividing, are they going up and training the spinous layer and then continually dividing? That's correct. Yeah. So there's a progression of cells out of the basal layer to the more purple layers and they continue to divide. Yeah. Why the kind of lobe shape of the bottom layer? Yeah, why this kind of um, undulating shape there? Um, I don't know exactly for this particular section why it's okay. like that. Um, you will see, and I think I have some other sections in photographs here, if there's a hair follicle or a sweat gland, that'll be a separate structure that's um, sort of integrated in with this tissue, but is still distinct, so. Okay, and here's just basically another picture of this from your book, and uh, kind of re-emphasizes some of these uh, points. So the melanocytes, these melanin pigments that they're making, kind of weird the way they do it. They make these little packets called melanosomes that are then transferred from the melanocyte out into the uh, spinous layer. So in this figure, the little black dots are melanosomes. And here you can see them up here in the granule layer uh, within these cells, giving pigment pigmentation to the cells. Okay, so all of this is in the epidermis, basically the outermost peripheral layers of the skin, and below that is uh, the dermis. So epi meaning above or on top of it, and um, above the dermis. Now the dermis is actually a mesoderm-derived structure, which is you know, more interior to the embryo. And here you can see all sorts of different structures, including hair follicles, some glands associated with those hairs, some muscles associated with the hairs, <coughs> um, a number of different vessels that are innervating all these tissues, uh, vessels and nerves, sweat glands, uh, and so forth. So um, many of these uh, connective tissues and, and the vessels, those are all mesoderm derived, but the hair follicles and the dermis and I believe the sweat glands, too, are all ectoderm-derived. So they're all structures that are originating in the epidermis and uh, folding inward. So at this point, I'll just take a moment to consider three words that start with E, so that we can draw a distinction in the meaning between these three terms, because they're all a little bit different. So first of all, ectoderm, uh, that is one of your germ layers. So ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And ectoderm, of course, is going to give rise to a number of structures in the body. Epidermis, that's referring to basically skin or the outer covering of the body, and including those four layers that we just talked about. So that's you know a derivative of ectoderm, but it's not the only thing that ectoderm makes. Uh, so sometimes, you know. I may actually refer to ectoderm or epidermis, but you know there is a distinct meaning to these words. Then epithelial. So now that really refers to the arrangement of cells in a sheet or a layer. 
And it's true that the epidermis is in an epithelial layer, and um, oftentimes ectodermic tissues are epithelial in nature. But the meaning of this word really refers to the arrangement of cells rather than anything to do with what germ layer or anything like that. So any questions on this? Yeah, just yeah. repeat the definition for the epithelial again. Okay, epithelial, um, it has to do with the arrangement of cells. And the epithelial cells are arranged in a sheet. Um, so they're connected to each other by you know, tight junctions or adherent junctions, as the case may be. It's so nice when they stop drilling. <laughs> wow. Okay, so uh, some signaling in this process. So the dermis is next to the epidermis, and you do it. Uh, there are signals coming from the dermis to tell the epidermis to con con continue to proliferate and to make more, um, make more cells. So you can expect to see some inductive factors acting on these keratinocyte stem cells to continue to promote their uh, proliferation, get them to go through mitosis. <coughs> But an interesting factor is that there um, can also be, uh, from within the basal cell layer itself, some signals to keep proliferating. So TGF-alpha, so this ends in GF, so it is a growth factor, therefore it's a paracrine factor, but it's a special class of a paracrine factor because it's what we call an autocrine growth factor. And with an autocrine growth factor, you have that growth factor acting on the same cells that make it. Okay? So in an autocrine growth factor, it acts on the same cells that make that product. In this particular example, we have the basal stem cells are making TGF-alpha, and then that feeds back onto the very same basal stem cells and tells them, keep growing keep pro proliferating, keep making more cells. One other thing to point out, transforming growth factor alpha is in a different gene family than TGF beta. So the TGF beta was a whole super family of genes. It included the BMPs, Activin, and a whole bunch of stuff. And even though this has a similar sounding name, it's actually a distinct gene family, it's a super family unto itself already, but distinct from the TGF betas. Okay, so in this uh, particular slide here, we're showing what would happen if a mouse is actually overexpressing TGF alpha. So anytime you see this word overexpression, um, you're talking about a situation where too much of this gene product is being made. And there are several ways you might achieve this. You could, for example, you might take the TGF-alpha gene and put it next to a promoter that's very, very active. And I think in this case, they've uh, taken the keratin promoter and put it in front of TGF-alpha and then taken that <coughs> gene and introduced it into the mouse. So if you have keratin driving TGF-alpha, uh, yeah, you're going to get a lot of TGF-alpha because think about how much keratin you get loads and loads of it. So we get loads and loads of TGF alpha expression. Now these basal stem cells go, start going bonkers. They just divide, divide, divide. And this ends up with a massive accumulation of uh, cornified cells on the outside. And uh, this actually has some problems for the mouse. For one, they have some trouble to shed these cells because there's so many of them. So they start to develop some skin conditions where they may get a little bit inflamed. Secondly, these structures here in the wild type mouse, these are follicles for hairs. So these are the little structures where hairs start to grow and then um, they protrude beyond the level of skin outside and make a nice fluffy hair. Well, there's so many um, basal stem cells here that the hair follicles never really have a chance to develop. So you see a mouse that uh, is more or less lacking in hair. <coughs> so there's got to be apparently some balance in terms of how much stem cells proliferating to make uh, skin cells, how much is enough and yet how much is too much. 
Okay, there's an interesting condition in humans and in psoriasis that is a similar sort of situation where you're actually getting an overproliferation of cells in the epidermis, and then this leads to inflammation when these cells have a hard time being shed and there's just not a good process of turnover for these cells. And so this may not actually be caused by an overexpression of TGF alpha in humans, but um, since that is a similar phenotype, it's still a useful model to try to study what's going on with this condition in humans and perhaps test the effect of some drugs on that TGF alpha overexpressing mouse and see if you can find things that ameliorate or lessen that condition. And that might be useful therapies for this sort of condition in humans as well. Okay, so TGF-alpha was made in the basal stem cells and acted on the basal stem cells. Um, there are also examples of factors made in the dermis that then acts on the overlying uh, basal stem cells. And one of these is keratinocyte growth factor. Uh, the name is sort of self-explanatory because it's causing the keratinocytes or those basal stem cells to continue to grow and proliferate. And so this is made in the um, dermis. And if you overexpress that, you get actually a, a similar phenotype where there are too many cells here in these layers of the upper dermis and difficulty shedding. It doesn't seem to be as dramatic for the hair follicle loss, so that mouse is really only um, missing hair in some of its limbs and its snout area, not over the whole body. But, um, you know, in principle, we're kind of walking down the same phenotypic path here. All right, so a little bit more about these hair follicles. This is another structure that is derived from ectoderm, and they're going to be anchored down into the dermis but um, there's some interesting things to say about how these hair follicles get started um, for paradigms and developmental biology. And so here now we're talking not about the eye, but about hair, and that you're going to see that same use of the um, concept of reciprocal induction. And this time the conversation is going to go back and forth between the dermis and the epidermis. So this uh, starts here with these 